Hello and welcome back to another short summary. I know it's most certainly been a while since my last upload on YouTube in general and our short summary, but I am continuing right where I left off chronologically with the June 3rd, 1980 tornado outbreak. This event is also known as the Night of the Twisters locally, and it's also also known as the Grand Island Nebraska tornado outbreak, and we will see why shortly. As per tradition, starting with our outbreak overview, as you can see, we have our Grand Island Nebraska tornadoes here. Grand total of seven would affect the area. So, as you can probably guess, there will be seven notables describing each one of them. But there are 29 tornadoes from this event, three of them being F4s. So, a relatively large amount of intense, violent tornadoes considering the amount of tornadoes that tornado count does indeed be low compared to other torna tornado figures from other outbreaks but still on top of the three f4s there were three anticyclonic tornadoes anticyclonic in the northern hemisphere is clockwise uh, high pressures, for example, are called anticyclones. Meanwhile, low pressures are called cyclones. You may even have heard tornadoes be called cyclones before. That's kind of where that term comes from, but not really. That's for another video. Damage as far as as far east as Pennsylvania occurred, as this storm system did indeed originate in Nebraska. And as storm systems do in the north, in the northern hemisphere, moved its way eastward. This event would injure 413 people across several states, most notably in Grand Island, Nebraska itself, and also definitely across, I believe it was Michigan and Pennsylvania. Although I could be wrong about that. Definitely Pennsylvania, though. <laughs> This system would also cause $3 million in damage in 1980 U.S. dollars and unfortunately cause six fatalities. Going back to Grand Island, the supercells specifically over this town were moving abnormally slow. We are talking only 8 miles per hour, which is around 13 kilometers per hour. If you know anything about supercells, you know that that is very, very slow. Usually they are propelled by a cold front or by a dry line or by a squall line, which move pretty fast. We're talking upwards of 20 to 30 miles per hour. So them going more than twice as slow is very strange. And I actually do not know why it was like that. We start with our first notable, however. Moving aside from that, this, not this notable started southwest of Waynetown and moved to Ladoga, Indiana. It was an F3. The track very roughly drawn out by myself on Google Maps in blue with a blue arrow. I could not find a track of this tornado despite me really trying. Or photos. This tornado would produce the only death outside of Grand Island and it was caused in a trailer. It happened in a trailer. This trailer was also evidently destroyed and then tossed across 30 acres of land. How that happens, I have no idea. This tornado would cause $2 million in damage by itself and would injure 16 people. High-end F3 damage was noted southwest of Crawfordsdale. And... Last but not least, this track is the complete opposite of what we usually describe a tornado track as. Usually, this would not be moving from Waynestown to Ladoga. Let's say it would be moving from Newmarket to Garfield. But that's just a, another interesting note about this one. We move to our second notable, which I could unfortunately not find any pictures of. This is the Ridgedale, West Virginia to Oakland, Maryland, F3. I, I just realized that I put F4s in there. I don't... Wait, no, sorry, sorry. I'm right about that. 
My bad. I apologize. <laughs> moving to, moving on from that. I'm sorry. I'm leaving this in too. There is 17 people injured from this tornado. And this tornado would cause $7 million in damage. This tornado was the most destructive tornado in West Virginia since 1944. Granted, if you know West Virginia, you'll know that number one, it's barely even a state. West Virginia? Um, be more creative. Second of all, tornadoes don't normally happen in West Virginia. But this is still an F3, so quite powerful. All jokes aside, 50 buildings were destroyed in West Virginia, 28 of them being homes. The rest of them were either businesses or other places. A trailer home park was demolished as well, and evidently from that trailer park, a, I believe it was a one or two year old, was thrown multiple miles and thankfully survived. Our third notable is our first of seven to affect the Grand Island, Nebraska area. That is a crazy amount to hit just one town in just one night. And it is very scary to think about that that can happen. Granted, I think this is more of an anomalous event than anything else, but the point still stands. This tornado actually started in St. Liberty, which is, for some reason, not marked on this map here, created by Dr. Ted Fujita and a teammate, and did go down, I believe it was south, actually, to Grand Island, Nebraska, and was an F3. Once again, the first of seven to affect the Grand Island area. I'm saying the Grand Island area because two of the seven, the last two, did not hit Grand Island itself. This tornado at its widest was 640 meters wide, so quite large, and had a ground time of 49 minutes. This tornado, as seen on this map, managed to execute seven loops, something that I've never seen a tornado do ever. And wow, that, that's just insane. This tornado tracked 23.3 kilometers, or in a straight line from start point to end point, 11.3 kilometers. This tornado did tragically kill one person, and damage is estimated to be at 2.5 million US dollars. And we thankfully do also have damage photos from this time as well. You can definitely see some slight wind rowing going on there. Last but not least, though, is that what we are seeing in this radar image is, I want to point out, this hole right here. That is actually this tornado right there. This this second hole right here is actually the radar site itself, the Grand Island NWS. So as you can see, it definitely did move from, from north to south. Again, this is usually the opposite way that tornadoes travel in the U.S. Usually it's from southwest to northeast and this little finger-like protrusion may seem a little odd uh good for those of you who caught it that is actually tornado number three an anti-cyclonic tornado and it is absolutely fantastic that we actually do have radar images from this time in 1980. going briefly over over notables two three and four of the Grand Island family, or parts four, five, and six for our purposes. The Grand Island Nebraska's F1, F3, and another F1, respectively. Very interesting to note that all three of these tornadoes are actually anticyclonic. Again, that means that they are rotating clockwise instead of counterclockwise. We also have the only known tornado uh, photograph from the time of the tornadoes that was actually taken during the outbreak. And we have tornado number two here, or notable four, and notable five right here. Of course, just from this photo, you can't tell that they're anticyclonic. 
These tornadoes were 150, 460, and 91 meters wide, again, all respectively. Very interesting to note that number 3 was mostly EF0 for most of its life. That is the horseshoe, that is the tornado that created a horseshoe-like pattern right here with its track. But as we zoom in here to Nebraska Veterans Home and Veteran Hospital, it actually produced F3 damage here, which is how it got its F3 rating, of course. And this tornado specifically, I don't know if this is from start point to end point, but it covered 5.6 kilometers. Notable 7 is our first F4 that we are going to talk about. This tornado barely scraped the town, just quite similar to how the 2013 El Reno tornado, the whitest on record, managed to just barely scrape El Reno. And if you if you just turn this track uh, 90 degrees uh, counterclockwise, you'll get something that's relatively similar to that track actually. But this is, again, this was an F4, so quite the powerful beast. This is number 5 of 7, or, num or notable number 7 for our purposes. This tornado would injure 110 people and tragically kill 3. It was a monster 1.6 kilometers wide at its widest. Given that we have not talked about an F4 up until this point, this tornado was indeed the most powerful of its family. Of seven. <laughs> Crazy to think that just maybe one or two supercells produced seven tornadoes. This tornado was relatively slow, taking 12 minutes to cover 19.3 kilometers. And thankfully, we do have another radar image from this time. And the wisps that we're seeing is actually the very beginnings of this tornado and we can see the at the very very middle top of this photo we do see the radar dead spots right there that's something to note about doppler uh it is not uh just like how when you move your hand so close that it becomes fuzzy the same thing happens with doppler it cannot focus on things that are too close to it moving aside from that we have parts we have our notables 8 and 9, or notable, or family members 6 and 7. These occurred southeast of Grand Island and were in F2 and F1, respectively. Both of these photos are from the tornadoes. One does belong to the other. And we definitely see our cycloidal marks here. That does not necessarily mean that they are F4 or F5s, though because proxy ratings can be very weird. They still are. But again, these are family num members number six and number seven of seven. 20 people in total were injured from these tornadoes, number seven only injuring two. These tornadoes were 1.6 and 1.8 kilometers at their widest, Interesting to note how the previous family members up until 5 were not very wide at all, and then here comes 5 through 7 being more than a kilometer wide. Again, biggest note here is that these tornadoes did not affect Grand Island, Nebraska. And thank goodness, because number 7's path is absolutely ridiculous. That thing had a path of 21.6 kilometers long, or from start point to end point, 6.6 kilometers long. Meanwhile, number 5 had a path of 9.7 kilometers long, or 5.5 kilometers from start point to end point, in a straight line. Why it's done in a straight line, and that's also called the official, tr the official track, I have no idea. That's an actual thing, by the way. The official tracks of these tornadoes for number 7 is 6.6 .6 kilometers long, and for number 6, it's 5.5. I have no idea why, again. 
Last thing from these tornadoes is that they each caused $2.5 million in damage. Our significance is that this is a very overlooked and the most unusual outbreak I have ever seen. However, when we look at the grand scheme of things in climatology of June, this is in character for the atmosphere, simply put. Dixie Alley and Carolina Alley, as well as Hoosier Alley is kind of seeing it, but June tornado touchdowns are much further north. And that's because usually we have our high pressures sitting around the deep south and our lows are forced to go high or more north than normal. And it's the opposite for, say, November or December, where that the you can essentially flip this part of the deep south and around Nebraska, Iowa, and the higher states, you can just flip those around. Something that I am very surprised about and also very happy about is that the Grand Island NWS team was awarded a Department of Commerce unit citation for all of their very hard work keeping up with all of these tornadoes. I cannot imagine how much work that must have taken for them to do during that time period because something like that is also very difficult to do nowadays and I do definitely commend them for that. And that is going to have to do it for our short summary. This did turn out to be a little bit longer than I had practiced, but that's fine. But thank you guys for sticking around so long to be able to see this new short summary. I appreciate it a lot. Depending on how I order the playlist, this may sound weird as it might just be right in the middle of one saying that I've been gone for so long. <laughs> but it definitely has been a while, and I'm glad that I'm back in the saddle here. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope that you'll tune in for the next one.